What's up everybody? This is Ryan Pulis from the Pulis Group with your real estate tax tips. We're a tax and accounting firm specializing in tax planning for real estate investors and small business owners. Today we'll be talking about the short-term rental loophole. Before we dive into short-term rentals, let's briefly re review the passive activity loss rules. Passive activity loss rules prevent taxpayers from using passive losses to reduce non-passive income, like W-2 wages and active business income. Passive losses can only reduce passive income. Losses in excess of passive income are suspended and carried forward to future tax years to be used against future passive income. Rental activities are considered passive by default, even if you materially participate. This is often referred to as the per se rule. They are passive per se. Qualifying as a real estate professional with material participation in your rental activities is one way to use your rental real estate losses to offset your active income. It's an exception to the per se passive rule for rentals. We discussed real estate professional status in depth in a previous video, so you may want to go look that one up. In addition to qualifying as a real estate professional, another exception to the passive activity loss rules are rentals in which the average customer stay is less than seven days. This is commonly referred to as a short-term rental. The short-term rental loophole refers to a section of the tax code shown here on the slide. It says, if the average customer stay at a rental is seven days or less, then your short-term rental is not a rental activity under the passive activity loss rules. This means all you need to do is materially participate in the activity for the losses to be non-passive and used to offset your active income. Let's briefly review what qualifies as material participation. The regulations define participation as any work done in an activity by an individual that owns an interest in that activity. To materially participate in an activity, the taxpayer has to be involved on a regular, continuous, and substantial basis. Regulations provide seven tests that can be used to demonstrate material participation. The first requires you participate more than 500 hours during the year. A uh, second test says your participation represents substantially all participation for the activity for that tax year. If you're the only person doing repairs, collecting rent, handling leases, etc., you'll pass this test. Third test requires 100 hours and more than anyone else. So this allows others to help you out, but you have to hit the 100 hour threshold and show that you participated more than anyone else. Test four says the activity must be a significant participation activity when combined with all significant participation activities totals more than 500 participation hours for the year. Uh, significant participation activities, any trade or business activity in which you participated for more than 100 hours during the year and in which you didn't materially participate under any of the other material participation tests that we're looking at here. You can pass test five by showing material participation in five of the preceding 10 years, whether or not consecutive. Test six can be passed by materially participating in a personal service activity for any three tax years, whether or not consecutive. The final test requires participation of more than 100 hours and is based on all the facts and circumstances. This is going to be generally be the most difficult to prove out of the seven tests. You only need to pass one of the seven tests to show material participation. The most common tests to demonstrate material participation for real estate investors are number two, the substantially all test, and number three, the 100 hours and more than anyone else test. Uh, as a note here, the, if you're a limited partner, then you can only use tests 1, 5, or 6 to show material participation. So how should you depreciate your short-term rental? Generally, residential real estate's depreciated over 27 and a half years. Here we have a little excerpt from IRS publication 527, which defines Rental real estate property is any real property that is a rental building or structure, including a mobile home for which 80% 80, or more of the gross rental income for the tax years from dwelling units. It does not include a unit in a hotel, motel, inn, or other establishment where more than half of the units are used on a transient basis. So the last sentence here is bolded to add emphasis. When more than 50% of the dwelling units in a building are used on a transient basis, the building is not considered residential real property. Therefore, it's non-residential property. This is important because non-residential property, like short-term rentals, 
because they are used on a transient basis, they must be depreciated over 39 years, not 27 and a half. Now, IRS publications are not authoritative sources, which means you cannot rely on IRS publications to support a tax position. Believe it or not, they're there, but if they happen to be wrong, then you cannot rely on the publication as a defense. So authoritative sources are the Internal Revenue Code and the related Treasury regulations, along with case law. So in the next slide, we're going to look at some citations from the authoritative sources, authoritative sources defining the terms, what we, basically what we just looked at from the IRS publication 527, which is correct. So the first citation here from section 168 defines residential real property as the term residential real property means any building or structure if 80% or more of the gross rental income from such building or structure for the taxable year is rental income from dwelling units. Uh, a citation right after that, still under section 168, says the term dwelling unit means a house or apartment used to provide living accommodations in a building or structure, but does not include a unit in a hotel, motel, or other establishment where more than one half of the units are used on a transient basis. The last citation on this slide goes on to define non-residential real property as meaning any section 1250 property which is not one residential rental property or two property with a class life of less than 27 and a half years. That's just a legal way of saying a building that is not residential property will be considered non-residential property. Now let's discuss how we report short-term rentals on your tax return. So you may hear differing opinions about where to report your short-term rentals. Do they belong on Schedule C, similar to other business activities, or Schedule E, like most rentals? And the answer is, it depends. If you're providing significant personal services, similar to what a hotel or motel may provide, then you should report the activity on Schedule C, and the income is also subject to self-employment tax, in addition to regular, regular income tax. Some examples of substantial services include things like daily cleaning or maid service while the tenant stays in the property. Now, no, cleaning between tenants is not considered a substantial service. Um, transportation services, food and beverage services, concierge type services, those are all examples of substantial services. If you're not providing these, then your short-term rental will, will be reported on Schedule E and taxed at the same rates as traditional rentals. No self-employment tax added. Section 1402A1 excludes rental, code, rental income from self-employment tax unless you're a dealer or providing substantial services. So your traditional rentals are not subject to the self-employment tax and neither will your short-term rental as long as you're not providing the substantial services. So, in this case, short-term rentals are excluded from the de definition of a rental activity only for purposes of Section 469, which gives us the passive activity loss rules. For every, all the other intents and purposes, your short-term rentals are still rentals. There's just a loophole where they're not subject to the passive activity loss rules, which makes it easier to deduct those losses against other sources of active income. So to recap, your short-term rentals are those rental activities in which the average customer stay is less than seven days. If you materially participate, the losses from a short-term rental can be used to offset active income. Short-term rentals are considered non-residential property for purposes of depreciation and should be depreciated over 39 years rather than 27 and a half. If substantial services are provided, then the activity is reported on Schedule C, otherwise it's reported on Schedule E. So that wraps up our discussion today on short-term rentals. I hope this was informative and helpful. Feel free to comment below and hit that like and subscribe button. We are always taking on new clients and will review your prior year tax returns for planning opportunities. If you'd like to work with us, then hit us up on our webpage at thepulisgroup.com forward slash contact. That's T H E. P U L I C E G R O U P dot com forward slash contact. Thank you.